Hello, everyone. My name is Hope Boykin, and wow, what a special Ailey All Access event this week. We are streaming Cry, choreographed by Alvin Ailey in 1971 as a birthday gift to his mother and to celebrate mothers everywhere. I am so very fortunate to be able to speak to the queen, the icon, the legend, the star, the woman herself, Miss Judith Jamison, to be able to talk to her about her legacy as the true gatekeeper for this masterwork from our founder, Alvin Ailey. Good day, Judy. Good day. Good morning. Hi, Hope. It's morning somewhere <laughs> it is, in my head. You know, right? It sure you know, is. I just got up and I know it's morning. And last night, I don't know if I slept, but it's morning. Oh, wow. And it's a wonderful morning because we all woke up, didn't we? We sure did. Yes, ma'am. There you go. Yes. How are you doing today? How are things, how are you feeling during this, what I've been calling intermission that, that the world huh? is on? I, I've, I've been doing fine, especially since I can see blue skies, gray skies. I can see all these skies clearly, yes. clearly. Yes. Even when it's cloudy, it's clear. You know, it's wonderful being able to see um, uh, pictures from all over the world of the how clear the air is in some places that are highly polluted. You know, right. so I'm, I'm very happy about that. that wakes me up every day. You know, to to understand that we are breathing better air. That's you know. That's so so there's always there's always the the upside. You know that you have to have that that side that you know you're protected. There's the upside of everything. Of everything. It's like doing. Well, I'm going to bounce right into it. But like doing cry. If I had known how hard this dance was when I was doing it the first time I went out, I wouldn't have come out on the stage <laughs> period but that's looking that's that whole a uh, gift that um mr ailey gave us our faith you know that you're not doing this by yourself because if i was doing it by myself after i couldn't feel my my legs from the waist down in the third <laughs> section of cry right on be free then i wouldn't have gotten through this and and i think probably knowing what this ballet was about. I didn't know what it was about. I knew this man was churning out movement that was, he would give me images and, and um, uh, make it, make it absolutely vital to what was going on in my life at the time and what was going on in the world and in the company, all of that, you know, to make it true, to make it ring true, you know, and that was his genius, wasn't it? Yes, you agree, yes. right? I totally agree. Genius. Actually, let me go back. Let me go back a second. So you joined the company in 1965, and you traveled around the world uh, with the company as a dancer. What was it like then, knowing that you were standing or you were you were bringing dance to so many people? We often quote Mr. Ailey and say, "Dance came from the people, so it has to be delivered back to the people." But what what was that like during that time? Because the civil rights movement was going on. You know, being a black woman um, walking down the street, this tall, elegant, regal woman. I mean, maybe you didn't think of yourself as that then, but that's how we all see you now. And I wonder what it was like being in the company, being a dancer during that time. Well, we were a small family. Remember, there were only uh, 10 dancers in the company when I joined. We traveled in a a bus, a bus, <laughs> not two buses. Two buses. That, <laughs> means, that means the props. The stools and the fans and everything, costumes, um, wardrobe person, lighting person, lights, luggage, all of us were on that bus. And it usually was a series of one night stands. And there, I had no problems thinking of my dignity. I didn't even think of it twice of who I was because I grew up in a household with, a, with parents that carried themselves in a certain way. And so I had the example of teachers and, you know, choreographers. And ever since I was six, you know, when I was studying as a child. So going, I was, I, you know, what can I say? The armor was on already, you know. I, I was prepared, not always, but if anything was going to come down the line uh, that would offend my civil rights or any of us in the family, Mr. Ailey would be, uh, able to take care of that, or you could take care of it on yourself and it, it by yourself. It wasn't so much 
um, what am I thinking of? I'm thinking of being in what state were we in? They all melt together after you've done a series of six weeks of one night stands. Right. So it w- it would be one time I remember going in a <clears throat> we stopped a bus stop on a lonely road. Was it West Virginia? I can't think of it. But we stopped in a restaurant and this you know person came over, the waitress came over kind of slowly and surely. We were the only people in there. And she finally brought the food out and and the milk that I had was so sour you could smell it as soon as, you know, she came from behind the swinging doors. So, that you know, those kind of slights were nothing compared to, to, you know, uh, what our civil rights uh, young students were doing, what the civil rights movement was about with people getting shot and beat up and all that I'm talking about sour milk, you know? Right. So right. Th- that to me is is the minimal for that I remember. I know there were other things going on in the background that Mr. Ailey was taking care of or Mr. Truitt, James Truitt, one of the original members of the company, he was taking care. So we were sheltered, all right? Mm-hmm. And um, no incidents that come to my mind of uh, hardships that could not be handled. And then the whole idea of bringing dance to the people. Well, some days, you know, you didn't feel, feel like bringing dance to anybody because you had been on that <laughs> bus, so, you know, all <laughs> night long <laughs> traveling. You, d- you did the performance in the gymnasium the night before. You got it, packed up everything, got on that bus with everything and drove to the next place and might have gotten in there four o'clock in the morning, five o'clock in the morning in, you know, a tacky hotel <laughs> or a motel or whatever it was. You stayed there and went to rehearsal if they could find space for us to rehearse in and got in that theater, sometimes very small theaters where people were right, looking right up your nose when you're dancing because they were that close. But what a joy it was once you went through all of the traveling and, the you know, all of that to actually hear the appreciation of an audience saying, I get it. I understand that. And then afterwards, having people stay afterwards to say, thank you, you know, and that, that to me was the the greatest appreciation to this day is when I see it for the last, since 1958, the same thing's been going on where as dancers in Ailey, you know, you are cherished and welcome, and people are so proud and happy to see you. You said that that you experienced sour milk and that maybe Mr. Ailey and Mr. Truett blocked you from things, but the path that you created for so many of us is just, it's, it's, it's awe-inspiring because had you not had your sour milk, mm. then I may not have been able to travel the world and do all of the things that I have been able to do. So I know that I speak for not just the dancers in the company now, but those who are coming after me, that we are grateful for this, you know, and, and which leads me right into what it was like, um, being a part of a creation. I know I've worked with you in the studio and when I'm standing in front of you, I want every part of me to give you what you need. You know, I want to be this blank canvas so you can see your ballet come to life. What was it like working in the studio with Mr. Ailey while he was creating Cry? Well, <laughs> we were on 229 East 59th Street, right around the corner from the store we couldn't afford to go to, Bloomingdale's. <laughs> and it was, a, it was a church. This was an old church that Pearl Lang was in. And Pearl Lang, I think they, they, Alvin and she got together and we ended up being inside her building and she would rehearse and we rehearsed. So there were three floors that I remember, if I can, if I remember this properly. And it was on the second floor, I believe, that he created this piece. This floor is a wooden, by the way. There's no Marley on them. Mm -hmm. And I don't know if Marley had been invented. But in any event, (laughs) um, you didn't get splinters or anything like that. That happened only when you were on tour. But uh, he created this piece (laughs) in something like eight days or less. 
because it was spilling out of him, you know, mm. and, um, you know, it wasn't until later that I, that you discover as a choreographer that your body language means so much <laughs> if you're standing there waiting for the next step and it's not flowing from the choreographer, you know what I'm saying? So yes. um, we always have to be aware of that. But uh, I had no time to do that because he was feeding me information. Um, it wasn't that it was quick, it was understood. So that's why I call it. Mr. Alien, my spiritual walker, because he didn't have to say anything to me half the time, most of the time. So, um, for instance, there's a, a silent scream in the second section of Cry where the woman's sitting on the floor. Uh, uh, her, her arms, her legs are splayed and her arms are, are reaching for air. And, and the suggestion was of a life or a look magazine. I'm not sure which one it was. The cover of it was a woman doing exactly that in the Biafran war. She was sitting on the earth with her baby right there in between her legs, sitting down crying and her arms were outstretched that way. He needed not to say anything more than that or with the scarf that you see wrapped around the head or, or used as a shawl. He, he didn't say anything about, um, this is dedicated to all black women, especially our mothers. Woo! He didn't say that. Thank goodness I didn't know that. Because that cloth is literally the weight of the world. That first section was the statement that he was making about how much we are carrying as black women. How much we are celebrated or not celebrated as queens how hard we work as scrubbing floors and are we not doing the same thing today? Hello. Right, and right. how hard the, the life has been because of the heel of someone's boot coming down on your back constantly. And he wanted to show that weight. And so he spoke of the weight, but he would be doing steps separate than what he just said. You know, he would be showing me movement. And some of, the, some of the time we didn't have the music. For Alice Coltrane, the very first section of the ballet, there was no he couldn't find any music. He choreographed the last section first, right was, on Be Free. I was going to ask you that if he did it mm -hmm. in order. But Out I've of been order reading, completely. Well, I've been reading a lot about how um, creators say you start with the end in mind. That's so interesting to me. It is interesting to me because every choreographer I work with did not start that way they started wherever they needed to start mm -hmm. you know to, to mm -hmm. just spill out what was in them at the time you know what i'm saying they didn't work in a certain order i i my hat is off to any choreographer that works in in order you know that um, i'm thinking of robert he has he you know he knows his music he's got it you know right everything lined up already in a row he knows exactly what he's doing um, sometimes when Mr. Ailey would come into the studio, he would not know exactly what he was doing. And that was okay because whatever he was doing, we were doing it right behind him. Right. right. You know, <laughs> you say, he goes step, step, but da, 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 We go, yes. Okay. Da, da. And he turned around and look at us like, did you get that? <laughs> and he had just done it like in a flash and we got it. But Judy, you know? that's you too. <laughs> no, that was, that was. I love that, though. Clifton and I would be in the studio with you and you'd say, oh, I'm feeling this. And you'd run to the right and run to the left. And I was like, gosh, I hope I get it. And whatever <laughs> I didn't get, Clifton would get. And it was just magic, though. So I right. totally understand what that must have been like. At least I think I, I understand yeah, what that must so, have been but, like. But, you know, because you work with Tally. So, you know, all choreographers do not have it all in a bunch in a row. You know, right, it's right. not always neatly put together. I, as I say, my hat's off to those who can do that. But sometimes people's creative juices are just coming when they're coming, when they're stuck. That's what I was talking about earlier, body language. you got to watch yes. that because right. it's not always flowing. But I was very blessed to work with him over those days uh, with the imagery he was giving me. And he didn't, you know, if something was not right, he all he had to do is there was a look. There was an ambiance in the air. That's why I call rehearsal space a sacred space. Because they're communicating spiritually. And so 
So that's why I said he didn't have to say anything. He would just turn around and look, and you knew that wasn't right. You knew that step was not right, or you knew that step was was absolutely right. That he, even though it might not have looked exactly, because nobody looks exactly like what the choreographer is giving them. There, he waited for your input as an individual, not to change his steps. But as a human being, you're going to interpret what those steps are, not right. change them. You know what I'm talking I about. I do, but, I do. You know, so. I, have, I have another question because, you know, nowadays due to, to the company's success and travel schedule, um, you know, and of course, once we get off of this intermission, our rehearsal periods are planned out to the minute. And you mentioned that Mr. Ailey made this work or the piece spilled out of him in just eight days. I mean, what was... Did you know what was, I, I guess my question is, how how did it end up forming? When did you know, oh, this is a ballet, this is the end? This oh, is geez. what he's trying to say. Right. I think, um, what was that date the curtain went up? Uh, the 1971. The um, premiere? I That's believe. what I'm talking about. We, we, <laughs> <laughs> you we, say it on that day. <laughs> I'm telling you, even up to the costume, because... If the music would be finished, you know, um, he finally found uh, Alice Coltrane and something about Coltrane. And uh, I had worked with the, with the scarf, you know, uh, separately and with some other music. I think it was hers. I'm not sure. So we got to the end of that and we got to the end of Laura Nero. Right. Uh, and we got to right on B3 to the end that I ran it from beginning to end, that was on the premiere. <laughs> I was going to ask you that question, That too. was the premiere. I never <sighs> ran it from beginning to end until the premiere. I knew what all the steps were and all that, scared to death. But then, you know, your professionalism kicks in, of course, and all that training that you've had. I mean, people keep, you know... Sometimes when students, and you know this because you teach students, they forget, what have you been doing all that? What have you been training for? Right, <laughs> you know? right, right. Tra- that's your underpinning. That's what's keeping you going. That's what will keep you going. You know what I'm saying? Wow. So um, with a whole lot of faith, let me tell you, thank God I grew up in the church. With a whole <laughs> lot of faith um, that I was, I remember standing. I remember him being backstage um, barely being, I, I just barely remember seeing him backstage. Uh, you know, I had to get sewn into the costume because it was my old four year old waiting in the water skirt because I used to do wade, and they had to run down to uh, what's the name of that uh, to get two leotards. Was and it Capizio? So, Capizio? Uh, yeah, yeah, mm. to get two leotards because my arms are so long that the the length of the they had to add extra length to the and then they had to cut the back not very low nothing was very low like it is now everybody's nice and low but it, that's what my costume was. and then they because the zipper was broke in the in the four-year-old waiting in the water skirt they had to sew me into that sucker so and tell me so, was there was it supposed to be a different costume at first? Yeah. That, oh, I forgot about that. Yeah, I came out on stage. Somebody had made a dress. God bless them. I have worn a dress on stage. <laughs> and, you know, and it was a wonderfully cut dress. And, um, no, it was, I, and I came out and <laughs> this was for the um, tech, which I think we had maybe an hour for. And on this dance, I had never done from beginning to end. And, I came out on stage. You, you know how you can't see out into the house because it's so dark, right. and the lights weren't that bright on the on the board. You know the light board when, you, right. when they're sitting out there. So all I heard was I came out. I, my lips were so low; it was ridiculous. I mean, I was so mad. I was like mad, and then I heard oh, I heard this <laughs> grunt, this groan, and I knew who. It came from, and it was Mr. Ailey, because he, he like knew it. I was unhappy, and he was very unhappy. And so that's when they ran out to get the leotards. I oh. forgot to preface it that way. Yeah, uh-huh. No, it was, ooh, Charlotte. Oh, no, that wouldn't have done at all. Not at all. 
So, so, so I'm glad so you, I got switched. So you mentioned um, that uh, you hadn't run the work in its entirety, and I don't know, no. you know, you remember this, uh, but when Robert Battle came to make Juba about 16 years ago, he mm-hmm. saved the woman's solo, which is my solo, for very last, and I had never run the whole work either, <laughs> and the day he said, okay, you know, we're done. And I was like, well, we haven't run it. And he calls you upstairs to see it. And then mm-hmm. in marches a parade of people. I thought I was going to lose a lung that day. <laughs> and so you're saying the first time you ever ran cry was on mm-hmm. the stage for the performance. Yes. Oh, my goodness. Could you talk a little bit more about how you felt? I mean, you mentioned yes. your legs, but <laughs> goodness I, I also have to mention the late, great Dudley Williams, because there, uh, uh, he... There, there was no tradition set because it was the first time I'd done it. And he could see, he was standing at the back of the house at city center. He could, he must've seen like, how is she going to get through this list? This last bit she's going through. And he came and stood in the downstage right wing. Oh, It's not, I, and I didn't really see him. I knew somebody was down there in that right wing. And later I was told it was Dudley. Wow. And he, he, you know, that energy, you know, that came out, he didn't say a word. Nobody said anything. You know, there was, mm-hmm. there was no like rah, rah, sis, boom, bah. but he was there. Dudley Williams was there in that wing. And what happened was, um, you know, if you, well, you know, you were talking about Juba. If this was the solo last it wasn't last, but it was in the last section. Right. So, and, you know, what I'm talking about, <laughs> yes. you don't, you don't know how much gas you have left. Right. Right. And so you have, you doing the Grand Prix and all of a sudden you come <laughs> around to that last lap and you're going like, run, 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 run. come on, motor, turn over, give me them, give me 400 horses, 700, 1500 horses. Now I need that horsepower. And all of a sudden your body goes, nope. Mm. No, uh-uh, uh-uh. I don't know why you thought I'd come up with any horsepower for you, but <laughs> this is it. And that's where I think athletes calling, hitting hitting the wall and all that. That's where on stage as a dancer, you got to dig deep. You have to dig, dig, dig someplace you have never been before. Mm. Because I spent myself in the first and, and second sections. Mm. And so that was that was probably one of the most difficult things to do. The most, most difficult thing to do is the second one. Mm. The you second know what I'm section. talking about? Mm. Oh, no. the second cry. The, your the second, second cry. Your second cry, right. Yeah, because you know what's coming. And you've got to figure out, all right, am I going for it uh, like I went for it the other day with my legs I couldn't feel? So you, you make that decision. And I made the decision to just go for it. But I was scared to death because you, you don't know. Go ahead. No, no, I was going to say you in your ballet hymn, there's mm-hmm. a line of one of my favorite sections. And you say that about the wall. You say, go to the wall, mm-hmm. go to the wall, because if you don't go to the wall, you're not going to find out anything. Yeah, yeah, and if you true. don't get any further today <laughs> than you did yesterday, then, then what's, what's the, the point? point? Right? Yeah, yeah. <laughs> exactly. Exactly. Yeah, that was my point. But that that to me is the emphasis of, of what. Anyone who's studying dance, who's who's training, and who's you know working on that instrument, that that to me is is your initial thought when you come to any kind of class that you're taking or learning any kind of new technique or or learning you know any any way of dancing that that you you what's the point of holding back? I don't understand that. Just go, go for it. Don't be timid about it. Just Go for it, you know. Otherwise, you're wasting your time and you're wasting mine. Mm-hmm. So I need, I, I always need to see that in in young dancers, in all dancers, that that they are giving every possible part of themselves that they can give. Mind, body, spirit, soul, everything, you know, with the gift that they've been given, you know. Yes. Yes. You you don't you don't you don't dismiss that gift. You work. It, it's special. And and I must say, the older you get, the real and you realize you can't be doing the same old things that you did before. You go like, oh, I didn't know I needed that muscle. 
Right, right. You know? Right. Oh, that's what was holding me up, was not holding me up now, you right. know? So you come to some realizations, the, the older you get some, you know, that some of those things don't work the same way they do. And your cleverness comes when you make the illusion <laughs> that it's working, mm-hmm. <laughs> you know? That's, that's the beauty of, of uh, the arts and being on stage and being creative, you know, I'm thinking too about times and, you know, like I, I, I said in, in the, in the beginning that you, that it's a privilege to sit and have these conversations or have this conversation with you, mm-hmm. but you shared something with me as a mentor, as an advisor, when I did, um, uh, one of our, one of our first pieces you selected, um, me, Matthew Rushing and Abdul Rahim Jackson to choreograph for the company. Oh yeah, oh, yeah. And, and you said now, here's your choice. You either read all the reviews or you don't read any. And, and I, and I, she said, because you have to take all that comes in. If you don't want mm-hmm. to know the good, you have to accept the bad with the good and everything. Mm-hmm. Now, when, once you performed cry, mm-hmm. I don't know how the reviews and things were happening at that time, but with whatever was said, did you ever have any idea? Did you think this work would become what it has today? And it's become what it has because of you. You know, I've, I've met people in city mm-hmm. after city say, I saw Judith Jamison hold the umbrella. I saw Judith Jamison do Fix Me Jesus. I saw mm-hmm. Judith Jamison do Cry. Did you ever think that this piece, this, this ballet would live the way that it's living? And do you think Mr. Ailey thought so? Uh, I don't I don't know if those thoughts cross your mind, you know, when you're choreographing something that in your mind while you're choreographing and you're going like this will last for a long time or generation <laughs> after generation. You know, you don't go through that. You, you right, know that. Right. But but what's uh, amazing to me is I put this on all the women who have done this dance after. And I particularly am thinking about Donna Wood, Donna Wood Sanders, who after I'm complaining about being so worn out after that, that first cry and the reviews were, well, I'll tell you about that in a second. But I think of Donna, who is the next one that, that uh, just did the stuffing out of, I mean, she was amazing, Dancing Cry. And she would do Cry and Memoria and Blue Sweet and the Umbrella all in one night. What? <laughs> yes, indeed. Alvin made memoria for her. And so it wasn't like, you know, you, you do cry. Okay, you can go home now. Now you got to finish, <laughs> you know, wow. and begin. So so the stamina and the strength and the artistic abilities of these early women is just um, what, what carries it forward, what makes it viable. If y'all... If each generation does not dance it and do it extraordinarily well, it dies. You know, Mm -hmm. that's why we have revelations as long as we have revelations. You know, each generation informs the next generation. And so my hat is off to anyone who has ever done this dance and kept it alive. Otherwise, it'd be dead. You know, nobody would know what it was, what what we were talking about. But I think also that, um, you were talking about what happened the next day. Of course, everything was very slow back then. This is 71. And uh, um, I think Mr. Ailey waited for the newspaper to drop because you had to, you had to wait for delivery of the newspaper uh, to drop at the New York times. Clyde Barnes wrote the review and Mr. Ailey called me something like four 30 in the morning. You know, I'm tired. <laughs> and I, I love that. I love, I love it because I had just been through all kinds of stuff, you know. And I'm t- I, my body needs some rest, you know. My mind is that he called me, called me on this phone, four o'clock, four thirty in the morning, and started reading this review to me. And I said, you know, oh, this is wonderful, and you know, and I got to go back to sleep which I did. So it didn't make an impression on me at all, except that he was so excited because he never read anybody's reviews to them. Oh, wow. So I didn't see it until the next day or, you know, and see it up. It wasn't up on a bullet or it was, you know, on a, in a newspaper. And it's the first time I had ever seen my name in headlines. 
So that kind of impressed me to see see my name in bold print. And then it just repeated back to me. Well, after that, you know, it was like a train taking off because the PR went crazy and uh, the box office had to change because well, I must mention Consuelo Atlas, most mm-hmm. beautiful dancer uh, in the company. She's, she's the late Consuelo Atlas. But Connie was in the room at the same time when I was learning it, she was learning it. I think Connie got a chance to do it maybe three or four times. And then they had to add mm-hmm. performances of uh, Cry. So they had to change the programming. And then people started calling the box office saying, is she dancing it? You know, wow. so that that just split the switch. Otherwise, I was quite content. Mm-hmm. I've been in all kinds of situations where I should not be here. And here I am talking to you about what a wonderful gift this is. Mm. And the gift for me, of course, now is y'all. You know, oh I get goodness. a chance to sit back and go like, oh, yeah, that's good. Oh, yes. Beautiful. When you walk into any rehearsal room for any reason, whether it's to say hello or remind the company of important details we're leaving out or to remind us what Mr. Alias said, you can hear a pin drop and you are our funnel to Mr. Ailey. You're our funnel to the history and you are a legacy that so many of us and I have my hand raised are longing to um, be a part of. And you are the voice that we long to hear, you know, nice work. Thank you for a good performance. Are you even this text message that I get that I did a screenshot of um, when you were proud of a, a performance and you mean the world to us. And I hope you know just how much uh, you do. I really do. You're welcome. I can't wait till we can chat again. This is fun. Come on with it. <laughs> okay. Thanks, thank, Hope. Thank you, Judy. Thank you. Bye-bye. Our extended family and audiences are in for a real treat because this week's uh, streaming will be Cry, choreographed by Alvin Ailey. And this performance is from 1972. And our audiences will get to see you, Miss Judith Jamison. And I am so excited because, wow, you have meant so much to me. You are... Are, like I said earlier, queen, icon, legend, star, and I'm just so thrilled. So thank you so much, Judy, for everything. Thank you, Miss Jamison, for this time. And thank you so much for joining us here for an Ailey Up Close with Judith Jamison as we celebrate Cry this week for our Ailey All Access. Now remember, if you have any questions about anything Ailey, don't hesitate to go to alvinailey.org slash Ailey All Access. A special class for our first responders, our people on the front lines, helping us, getting us through this difficult time. And um, like Mr. Ailey said, dance came from the people, so it's got to be delivered back to you. Thank you so much again. I'm Hope Boykin, and I can't wait for this next one. This was really fun. Have a great day.